in the studio with me is Paul Walker, who's the CEO of Isondo Precious Metals. Paul, thanks very much for joining me. I haven't seen you since you've been Isondo, uh, the top man at Isondo. Please briefly tell us about the company. We're basically a beneficiation play focused on the PGM markets. We represent a company called Tanaka Kikinzoku. We've been working closely with them for the better part of two years now, really trying to explore what is possible within the PGM space. And as I guess we'll probably discuss later on today, I think there's a need to do something quite radical yeah. on the demand side in the PGM space here in South Africa. It really is. I mean, if you look at the screen now, you've got uh, gold at 11.92 and platinum $50 discount at 11.42. I mean, five years ago, mm. probably, uh, when did we first start speaking? Seven or eight years ago. I don't know what the premium of platinum over gold was, but it was significant. And who would have thought that an industrial metal with precious metal qualities would have been languishing where it is now? Well, I think, you know, it speaks to a theme that when I was still running GFMS, five or six years ago, mm. uh, we spoke about this quite uh, at quite some length, that there needs to be a demand side a shift. And I think that, quite frankly, the South African producers, to an extent, uh, took their eye off the ball. They just believed that uh, the past was the future and that the trajectory of PGMs was in one direction. Yes. You know, the, the bull market starting in the 80s through the 90s and 2000s, diesel, platinum, big uh, demand side driver. And we were warning uh, seven, eight years ago that this was likely to change. And uh, indeed, you know, it's come to, come to bear and probably worse than I would have anticipated. Mm. We're going to get on to PGMs in a moment. But we want to look at the gold price now because I know although you, your, fo your company is focused on PGMs, uh, we have, I know you keep your eye on w with gold. 1192, I think probably the last time we spoke it was about 1500, something like that. And then after that went to 1900, 1930, Indeed. something like that. Would yep. you have thought it could have come back as much as it did? Well, you know, I was always uh, quite cautious about the outlook for gold. You know, there are two, two dimensions to gold. One is the kind of risk uh, play, uh, but that's always going to have a, a short term impact on prices. But the backdrop is always going to be an interest rate one. And I've always argued that for a better part of 20 years. Mm. And where we see gold today is a reflection of of more the interest rate environment and the dollar strength than it is anything else. And certainly the, the uptick in the price in the last, uh, what's it, week yeah. has been really a dollar story as much as anything else. But it's not just about the dollar, because if you look at the correlations, and I used to argue this endlessly as well, that there is no clear stark correlation uh, in between the dollar and gold. Never has been. Uh, but in short term periods. But interest like rates, there is a correlation. Interest rates, absolutely. I think if you look back to when gold was freed up, uh, I would argue that the, the bedrock understanding of why gold has behaved uh, the way it has is the bedrock of interest rates. And as long as interest rates stay where they are, I mean, we are in, in uncharted territory. I mean, I would argue that it's uh, bonkers when you start to see uh, negative yields on German debt. You know, you pay for the well, privilege. Well, the world's gone mad. I mean, if you could, if I could say, right, I'm going to close, uh, I mean, you're not allowed to trade anything um, for the next um, three or four years, uh, but the interest rate in the United States is going to go from zero to three and a half to four percent, and gold is currently $1,200 an ounce and you could buy gold now and sell it uh, in five years time. Where do you think the gold price would be? Well, I think three or four percent uh, dollar interest rates for gold are catastrophic. Mm. Uh, and this is, I think, the, the way I've always argued there's downside risk for, for gold. Look, when, when that interest rate cycle turns is anybody's guess. I would have argued that it would have turned before it has. So I was wrong on that, uh, on that call. But if you tell me that, that interest rates are going to be three or four percent in dollars, gold is sub a thousand dollars. Absolutely no two ways about it. Yeah. Is that because of the contango factor? In other words, the spot price um, being, uh, say, 1200 and with interest rates rising, then the future price of gold is, is higher, of course, by definition, and therefore the producers use that contango? Well, the two, the two reasons, for that, that's one. That's, in a sense, the, uh, the contango, the hedging argument. Mm. And I think at 3 or 4%, some producers would definitely look uh, very seriously at hedging again. Yes. But the real risk for gold is the opportunity cost, the, the carry argument. And there are still substantial holdings of, uh, of gold globally, in London in particular. The ETF holdings have come down, but they're still substantial. And the reason people are willing to hold these is there's zero opportunity cost uh, to it at the moment. Yes. And as long as it stays that way, I don't think gold's going to budge too far from where we are. It's going to trade between eleven, twelve hundred dollars $1,200 as it has for, for much of the last six or seven months. Yeah. Okay, so that's gold. Let's go on to PGMs now, because that's the disturbing one. $50 discount is platinum to, to gold. We've already mentioned that that was almost unthinkable a few years ago. And we've got to play the blame game now. The, the, the unions uh, get it in the neck all the time because they demand, <laughs> uh, they demand this and they demand that. It's not the full story though. Is no, it? it's not. You know, I, I would argue that there's been uh, a lack of strategic thinking on the behalf of the producers when 
you know, they were making hay, they really didn't take into account what the downside risks were. If there was a big shift in demand, and if there were fundamental uh, strategic shifts in the auto industry in particular, away from diesel to uh, from, from diesel and platinum to uh, other metals, including palladium and uh, and other substitutes. And you know, it's not as if this is a new story. And I was. Uh, evangelizing about that, if that's the right term, many, many yes. years ago, mm. and saying these are long term strategic issues you need to consider. I mean, who would have thought that the mayor of Paris would talk about banning diesel in, uh, in Paris because of the, the pollution effects? Well, look at London. I think Islington started it, the borough of Islington. I think yeah. you have to pay 86 quid a year or something if you've got a, a diesel car that they were encouraging you to buy two years ago. Yes, and, and these are, I mean, these are the problems that underpin it. You know, these, and again, it's not a new story. Uh, the whole particulate matter story was something uh, 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, the auto companies undoubtedly have tried very hard to address this, but the, uh, the fitment of particular filters has not done enough uh, to mitigate the, uh, the risks politically and otherwise to the use of platinum in, in diesel. Mm. So the question is, what's the demand side kicker? Jewelry ticks over in, in Japan and, and China, but it's really not going to be a major driver of the price. Uh, what other thing is there in in the next five to ten years that can drive it? Now, you know, I speak uh, for Isondo, and I, I have a vested interest in in the fuel cell space. And uh, the cynics who've heard me speak over the last twenty years would say I was always a cynic about fuel cells. In the use, their use in automobiles, I've always been a bit cynical. Mm. Stationary fuel cells, you're starting to see rapid growth in the African continent here in South Africa, and I think that's where you could actually see a fundamental shift in the fortunes for platinum if we get it right. But it's yes. about the hydrogen economy. Uh, the government's been talking about this. I attended a conference. I think it was in 2000 in South Africa, talking about the future of the hydrogen economy. And nothing really has happened on that score since. So I think the, the producers need to get together. I think there needs to be a real focus on how they uh, get a new demand side driver. The unions, sure, they're going to uh, probably compound the problems. But I think the real fundamental starting point for this uh, difficulty has been the, the lack of demand. Yeah, indeed. Uh, gold became a sunset industry in 1970 when we produced 1,100 tonnes in South Africa and we haven't produced anything like that. We will continue to produce less and then some, unless some dramatic new mining technique is, um, is invented that doesn't involve um, uh, people, preferably. Um, the problem is now that uh, perhaps, although it's not the sun isn't setting, the cloud has certainly covered the platinum uh, sun uh, recently. Any chance that we won't recover? Well, I think there is an existential problem here, and the, the difficulty is uh, in South Africa and the production side. It's not just about the unions, it's about power, and you know, I, deal, I still deal with a lot of the, uh, the value-adding members of the platinum industry, and their concern is the sustainability of supply out of South Africa, and they're looking to substitutes. The first obvious place to look as, at is AutoCAT recycling. Everybody's piled into that as a hedge against South African risk. But a broader, more worrying backdrop here is what does happen when the Tanakas and the Johnson Matthews of the world look at the sustainability of uh, the platinum industry here and go, you know, we really need to diversify, look for substitutes and thrift. Mm -hmm. And those forces have always been in play, but I think they've become compounded, certainly since the energy crisis hit in South Africa, and it does worry me that we don't recover from here. Yeah, Paul, thanks very much for coming in. Please go and lobby the platinum industry on our behalf and all the parties involved in the platinum industry. That's Paul Walker, who's the CEO of Isondo Precious Metals.